very good morning to all of you. <clears throat> A warm welcome to the specialty update on gastroenterology conducted by the Ceylon College of Physicians. This is the month of April, and then this is the month of gastroenterology. As you know, we have divided uh, each month of the year into a specialty. And this year, uh, this month, the <clears throat> uh, Young Physicians Forum, as well as, uh, as, well as the specialty update was, is on, on this, on gastroenterology. Uh, and then, of course, um, I apologize for any inconvenience caused by switching from a hybrid to a pure Zoom meeting. The reason for that was uh, uh, due to many crises people are facing, we felt it was better this way. Uh, and then, of course, I think all of us have an obligation to save as much fuel as possible because the Indian credit line is likely to run out very soon. So it's, it's considering everything, what we felt was best for everybody, best for the country as well. And then this is the first uh, specialty update or CCP thing I'm conducting while seated outside and near under an ahala tree in the Faculty of Medicine uh, in, in Gaul. This is where I work. So warm welcome to you from Gaul. And then <clears throat> uh, we are doing this in collaboration with the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology. And it is my great pleasure uh, to invite, uh, to, to welcome all uh, five speakers, as well as the president of the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology, Professor Rohan Sirivardhana, and then of course, Professor Madhunil Niriella, who helped us put this wonderful program together. I'm very grateful to the two of you, as well as the speakers. So, and a warm welcome to all the uh, registered participants as well. And then thank you, Nalina, for a very quickly attending a short notice to all the IT facilities, uh, facilitation of this program. Uh, and then without any further ado, may I invite uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Rohan Siribardana, to speak a few words to you and then introduce the speaker lineup and the program lineup. Have a very pleasant and a fruitful program. That's my wish. Thank you. Thank you, Arosha. Uh, first of all, on behalf of uh, the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology, I would like to welcome you all for this uh, specialty update. And I would like to thank, thank uh, the Sidon College of Physicians uh, uh, for organizing this event. And uh, I think uh, uh, we may belong to different specialties, but at the end of the day, uh, what really matters is the patient outcome. And the best way to achieve that is updating our knowledge. And this is what we are trying to do today. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Niriyala who organized, uh, line up the topics and organize the speakers for today's discussion. And today we have five speakers representing our college, our society uh, uh, on this specialty update on gastroenterology. Dr. Kulisha Kodisinghe, uh, who's a consultant gastroenterologist uh, from General Hospital Mathara, who will be discussing with us uh, about the evidence-based approach to irritable bowel syndrome, one of the most, uh, or one of the commonest uh, conditions that we encounter in our practice. And Dr. Eranga, Eranga Thalagala, uh, consultant gastroenterologist from General Hospital Matale, uh, will be discussing with us about the medical management of inflammatory bowel disease in 2022. And Dr. Manangal Senayaka from Teaching Hospital uh, uh, Kaluthara will be discussing with us about the uh, uh, about the evaluation and management of clinically significant portal hypertension. And Dr. Hasanta, Hasta Vijayavanta, consultant gastroenterologist from Teaching Hospital Ratnapura, uh, will be discussing with us uh, about optimizing management for maximum benefit in MAFLD. And finally, uh, Dr. Achini Vitanachi, uh, consultant gastroenterologist from General Hospital Hambantata, We'll be discussing the management of hepatocellular carcinoma in 2022. Uh, let me once again thank the organizers and invite you all for a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. So to uh, kick off today's proceedings, uh, I'm going to speak about an uh, evidence-based, sorry, an evidence-based algorithmic approach to the problem of irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, so, as you know, this is a very common problem we face as clinicians. Uh, so, this is an overview from my presentation. We are going to discuss about the diagnosis a little bit, and my but my main concern today is going to be on uh, the evidence-based management part of the irritable bowel syndrome. 
so uh, as clinicians, we face a lot of patients who come with altered bowel habits. Uh, but the problem is, do we investigate each and every patient, which is not practical? Uh, so uh, because of this, uh, this foundation, International Foundation called the Rome Foundation, has uh, uh, put forward the classification for functional gastroenterologists, irritable bowel syndrome being one of them. So currently, this uh, classification is in the fourth iteration. So according to this, uh, there are certain diagnostic criteria uh, and uh, uh, there are three main criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, the patient should have recurrent abdominal pain with two or more of the following features. That is, the pain should be related to defecation. It can either improve or worsen uh, after the defecation. And there should be a change in the stool frequency, less than three times a week, which is constipation, or more than three times a day. And there should be a, uh, uh, or there should be a change in the stool form. Now, this is a very subjective thing because uh, constipation or diarrhea for one person might not be a constipation or diarrhea for another. So, for the purpose of this uh, uh, classification, they have used the Bristol stool chart, which gives a pictorial representation of different types of stools. Uh, as you can see, the type 1 and type 2 is called constipation, 6 and 7 are called diarrhea. Uh, so, the patient should have recurrent abdominal pain plus two or more of the other three features. So abdominal pain is a must. A patient who has altered bowel habits without any abdominal pain, uh, you can't uh, diagnose it as irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, then the patient should have uh, chronic disease. Uh, uh, by chronic, it means that the symptoms should have been there for, uh, the symptom onset should have been uh, about more than six months before. And the symptom duration should have been for more than three months in that period of six months and the free, uh, frequency of the symptoms should be at least once a week. Uh, and the third criteria is absence of obvious anatomic or physiological abnormalities identified by routine uh, diagnostic examinations. Uh, they have introduced this KVA because uh, uh, to make sure that uh, people don't miss uh, other sinister pathologies. Uh, so when it comes to diagnosis, uh, uh, routine history and routine examination is a must. Examination includes abdominal examination and anorectal examination as well. Uh, out of the routine investigations, full blood count uh, should be done in all patients. Inflammatory markers, CRP and fecal protein in patients who are, who are non-constipated, either diarrhea or mixed uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, stool full report and culture, again in uh, non-constipated IBS. Serological tests for celiac disease are recommended in the guidelines, but this is actually not very relevant to our country. Uh, if you suspect hy hypo or hyperthyroidism, you are supposed to do thyroid tests. Uh, what about the uh, pace for colonoscopy? Should all patients with altered bowel habits undergo a colonoscopy? Definitely not. Uh, patients more than 50 years of age should have a colonoscopy. Those who are younger than this should have a colonoscopy if there are alarm symptoms or signs. That is, uh, the patient may have atypical symptoms like rectal bleeding, weight loss, uh, nocturnal symptoms like nocturnal diarrhea is a, a, a suspicious sign, fever, and any recent, very recent change in, in the symptoms. Uh, and if the patient has a family history of uh, colorectal carcinoma, uh, IBD or celiac disease, again, the patient should have a colonoscopy. Uh, and abnormal physical examinations that you find during the examination, abnormal routine investigations uh, out of the ones that you have done. And uh, in patients who have uh, failed empirical therapy for irritable bowel syndrome, again, there's a place for a colonoscopy. Uh, and in patients uh, who have non constipated IBS, you are supposed to take biopsies from the right and left colon when you do a colonoscopy is to exclude uh, the possibility of uh, microscopic colitis. So moving on to the, uh, my uh, main part of my presentation, which is uh, treatment for irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, actually, not all patients with the IBS need treatment because uh, patients, uh, the patients who don't have much symptoms, they might just be satisfied with your uh, reassurance that there's nothing sinister going on. Uh, treatment actually depends on the degree of symptoms the patient have and uh, the, the, how the symptoms affect their day-to-day -day lifestyle. So there are three main categories uh, when it comes to treatment. 
diet and lifestyle modification, pharmacotherapy, and psychotherapy. Uh, so under uh, uh, we'll be discussing the evidence base for each and every one of these uh, different modes of treatment. The, the ones I have indicated in, in red are the ones that are available to us in our country. So as you can see, there's a lot that are not available to us. Uh, so diet and lifestyle modification, the simplest things that you can try is alteration of fiber intake. Now, when it comes to fiber, there are two main types, insoluble and soluble. Insoluble fiber is not good for IBS because it can worsen the bloating and abdominal discomfort. These are present in hard to chew parts of grains like whole grain and vegetables like cabbage and uh, fruit like the skins of fruit. Uh, soluble fiber, on the other hand, is beneficial, uh, which is present in starchy foods. And uh, a common uh, pharmacological preparation that we can use is uh, psyllium, which, is, uh, which comes under the brand name of fibrogel, which has uh, soluble fiber. Lactose restriction might be beneficial because uh, uh, compared to the normal population, IBS patients have been found to have uh, lactose maldigestion more commonly. And in Asians, anyway, it's common. Uh, fat restriction might be tried. And generally, encouraging healthy eating habits, reducing alcohol and caffeine, and encouraging exercises are beneficial. So these are general things that we can try. But are there any more specific, uh, more advanced methods of uh, dietary modification? Yes, there is a uh, low FODMAP diet. Uh, the FODMAP mnemonic uh, stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So these are actually uh, uh, non-absorbable uh, uh, saccharides, which, are which when, uh, when they are present in the gut, they cause osmotic effect and draw the water into the gut and can worsen the bloating and abdominal discomfort. In addition, they are, uh, they are broken down by the bacteria and they produce hydrogen. So this is the landmark trial that has uh, investigated the benefit of uh, low FODMAP diet. Uh, this trial has been uh, done by a uh, team in Monash University in Australia. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the, the low FODMAP diet, which is indicated in the, uh, in the lower line, this one, uh, has uh, benefit with regard to mean overall gastrointestinal symptoms compared to the typical Australian diet, which is indicated by the, uh, the top line. Uh, when it comes to, uh, this is for IBSM patients, when it comes to healthy controls, uh, there's no difference between the two types of diets. Same benefit is seen in, uh, with regard to bloating, abdominal pain, and passage of pain. Uh, but how is this uh, applicable to our diet? So this, uh, this table uh, summarizes the types of uh, food that has FODMAP and non-FODMAP. So uh, the FODMAP foods, uh, wheat is high in FODMAP, but rice doesn't have FODMAP. Certain vegetables has FODMAP, uh, but certain ones don't have. Uh, when it comes to fruits, uh, fruits, with, uh, fruits that are very sweet uh, have high FODMAP. Uh, and non FODMAP fruits, mainly banana and papo, they don't have much food, uh, much FODMAP. Uh, milk, cow's milk are high in FODMAP. Other types of milk, like soya milk, doesn't have FODMAP. When it comes to sweetness, uh, very sweet fruit juice, honey, large uh, doses of fructose are high in FODMAPs, but uh, limited amounts of sugar can be allowed. So the uh, American College of Gastroenterology Guidelines 2021, which is the latest guidelines on IBS, recommend a limited trial of low FODMAP diet in patients with IBS to, because they improve global symptoms. But uh, they recommend this be done by uh, under the guidance of a proper, uh, properly trained GI dietitian. This is a problem in our country because we don't have this uh, specialty. Uh, when it uh, comes to fiber supplementation, this uh, meta-analysis shows the um, uh, studies that have been performed. Uh, the first uh, first part, which is bran, which is a, a non, which is a insoluble uh, uh, fiber. As you can see, there's no statistically significant benefit with uh, bran. But when it's when it comes to isfagula, which is uh, same as psyllium, which is found in fiber gel, there's a statistically significant difference. Uh, benefit actually uh, with a number needed to treat of seven. Uh, so um, because of this, 
we can recommend uh, use of uh, uh, fiber, uh, soluble fiber in these patients. The ACG recommends that soluble but not insoluble fiber be used to treat global IBS symptoms. Uh, what, what are the place of loperamide? The guidelines, the latest guidelines actually, they don't recommend uh, loperamide as first line therapy because uh, it improves diarrhea, but it doesn't improve the other global symptoms like uh, abdominal pain, uh, and discomfort. It doesn't improve those, but improves only diarrhea. But this is because they have better drugs. Uh, they have this uh, mixed opioid agonist and antagonist. Loperamide is a, uh, is a opioid agonist, but they have a mixed agonist and antagonist called eluxodoline, which actually improves the diarrhea and improves the global symptoms as well. But uh, we don't have this in our country. So we use loperamide to treat the diarrhea component, but you have to remember that it, it won't give benefit with regard to abdominal pain or discomfort. Uh, 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. This is the class of drugs we have, uh, which uh, the ontan belongs to. Uh, so the evidence with regard to this, um, uh, this, this is with regard to global IBS symptoms. As you can see, overall, there's a benefit uh, with regard to global IBS symptoms, but there's no evidence with regard to ontan these other drugs are beneficial, uh, but we don't have them in our country. Uh, when it comes to abdominal pain and discomfort, there's evidence with regard to ondansetron and it doesn't give any benefit, but the other drugs do with regard to abdominal pain and discomfort. When it comes to diarrhea, that is abnormal bowel habit, this ondansetron has a benefit, uh, as do other drugs. So uh, the, the the guidelines they recommend, uh, they, what they recommend is actually allocetron, which is the uh, uh, same class of drugs, but we don't have this in our country because it improves the diarrhea and improves the global IBS symptoms. Ondansetron improves the bowel symptoms, but not the abdominal pain and discomfort, again, similar to uh, loperamide. So if you want to improve the bowel symptoms only, you can try ondansetron in these patients. Uh, probiotics are very uh, popular drug among clinicians for irritable bowel syndrome, but is there any, any uh, uh, trial evidence for this? Uh, when it comes to global symptoms or abdominal pain, it improves, there's a statistically significant uh, improvement with regard to probiotics. Uh, bloating scores again improves and flatulence scores again there's improvement. So does this mean that we should use, use uh, probiotics because everything seems to improve uh, with, when you use probiotics. Uh, but guidelines, they actually suggest against the use of probiotics for the treatment of global IBS symptoms. This is because there's uh, only limited trial data and mainly because of the heterogeneity of the different combinations available. So uh, even when you go through this one, you can see there's a combination. Combination has different kinds of different organisms. And there, then there are versions which have lactobacillus only, which have bifidobacterium only, which have saccharomyces only. So because of the various kinds of different preparations and lack of data with regard to one preparation, they suggest against the use of probiotics uh, in irritable bowel syndrome. Rifaximine, this is an unabsorbable uh, antibiotic. Uh, this, this, uh, this data is for non-constipated IBS, not for constipation. Uh, and as you can see, uh, rifaximin improves the, the, the global, IB, uh, global symptoms with a number needed to treat of nine. What is, what is uh, important is that uh, uh, it improves the symptoms in patients without previous rifaximin therapy, but in patients with, who has been previously uh, previously uh, exposed to rifaximin as well. So this means that you can uh, reuse rifaximin. You can give rifaximin and uh, if the patient responds to that, but uh, later on they get the symptom again after a few months, you can give a, a short course of rifaximin again. Generally, we give it for about 10 to 14 days at a dose of uh, about 400 TDS to 550 BD. Uh, so the guidelines also recommend the use of rifaximin to treat global IBS symptoms. We have this in our country. But this is, you have to remember that this is only for diarrhea predominant version of irritable bowel syndrome. 
Uh, what about laxatives? Guidelines actually recommend against the use of uh, laxatives, the, mainly the polyethylene glycol version, which is uh, the one that is available in clean prep and uh, things like Movicol, uh, uh, to relieve global IBS symptoms in patients with constipation predominant IBS. They, they suggest against the use of this. Why is that? Because they have better drugs, secretagogues, which are lobiprostone and linacrodide. Uh, they recommend uh, to treat global IBS symptoms uh, with these drugs because they improve the global symptoms and uh, relieve the constipation. But since we don't have this, there's a place for other laxatives uh, just to improve the bowel component of the uh, disease. Uh, 5-HT4 receptor agonist, uh, tegacerot, we don't have this, but they recommend for IBS uh, constipation predominant variant. Uh, antispasmodic agents. We commonly use these for the pain component in these patients, things like buscopan or mebavarine. But uh, what are the evidence? Uh, for, so for the pain relief, uh, there has been no statistically significant benefit with regard to mebavarine and hyoscine, which is buscopan. Uh, when it comes to abdominal distension and bloating, again, mebavarine doesn't have a statistically significant difference. Uh, when it comes to global symptoms, mebavarine, no statistical significant difference. There has been some benefit with the uh, hyoscine, but mebavarine doesn't have a, a statistical significant uh, benefit. Uh, peppermint oil, which is again an uh, antispasmodic, uh, improves abdominal pain, improves global symptoms as well. So the guidelines recommend against the use of antispasmodics. Uh, to treat global IBS symptoms, but the antispasmodics that they have, uh, they don't have mebavarine, they have hyoscine. Uh, so they recommend against the use of hyoscine, but they don't make a recommendation for mebavarine. But as, as you can see in the trial evidence, uh, there doesn't seem to be much benefit for mebavarine as well. Uh, but they recommend peppermint oil, uh, which offers overall benefit uh, with regard to pain and um, uh, global symptoms as well. Antidepressants, what's the place of antidepressants? Two main classes, tricyclics and SSRIs. Uh, both improve global symptoms. When it comes to abdominal pain, tricyclics improve the, the abdominal pain, but SSRIs, there has not been any, there's, there's a trend towards benefit, but there has not been a statistically significant difference. The number needed to treat is uh, for tricyclics 4.5, SSRIs 5. So the guidelines recommend that tricyclics can be used to relieve, uh, relieve global symptoms of IBS. Uh, they don't mention about SSRIs here. But the problem is uh, uh, for patients who have constipation predominant IBS, if you give a tricyclic, you can worsen the constipation. So in these patients, uh, we can try a SSRI, which, uh, which actually as a side effect causes a little bit of diarrhea as well. Uh, psychological therapies. Uh, so this, uh, this meta-analysis uh, gives the evidence with regard to uh, different types of kinds of psychological therapies. The ones I have indicated in red are the ones that have uh, some benefit. Cognitive behavioral therapy, relaxation therapy, multi-component psychological therapy, hypnotherapy, and dynamic psychotherapy. All these give statistically significant uh, benefits with a number needed to treat of four. So the ACG guidelines recommend that directed psychotherapies for global IBS symptoms. This is because uh, these are harmless and they have shown that uh, even after you stop these uh, psychotherapies, the benefit uh, persists even after you stop the sessions. Uh, so this uh, table summarizes all the drugs that are drugs and uh, other measures that have been, uh, uh, that can be used to treat IBS patients and the predominant symptoms that uh, they can be used in. So in a patient with global IBS symptoms, there's a place for dietary manipulation, fiber supplementation, rifaximine, peppermint oil, tricyclics, and psychotherapy. They give benefit with regard to every, the whole global symptoms of these patients. There are other drugs that are not available to us. Uh, when it comes to diarrhea, uh, dietary manipulation benefit gives some benefit. Loperamide improves the area, but uh, as I 
said earlier, it doesn't improve the global symptoms. Uh, ondansetron again improves the diarrhea, but not the global symptoms. Uh, rifaximin improves the diarrhea. Praise for probiotics is questionable. When it comes to constipation, what we have is laxatives. It improves the constipation, but not the global symptoms. We don't have these other better versions. When it comes to uh, pain, antispasmodics, there's a questionable pace. Uh, peppermint oil recommended in the guidelines. Uh, and this is available in some formulations in our country as well. Uh, and the pain, uh, main thing that we have in our, our situation is uh, uh, antidepressants. Uh, when it comes to bloating, dietary manipulation gives benefit. Antidepressants have benefit. Probiotics has a questionable place. Uh, so in summary, the ROM criteria helps to diagnose IBS. Abdominal pain is an essential feature without which you can't diagnose IBS. Few routine investigations are recommended. Full blood count, inflammatory markers like CRP and fecal fat protein, stool food report and culture, and thyroid test if the patient has clinical features of hypo or hypothyroidism. Colonoscopy recommended if the patient is more than 50 years old or in the presence of alarm symptoms and signs. Treatment consists of dietary treatment, pharmacological treatment, and psychotherapy. Uh, thank you. If there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Kodi Singh, for this excellent uh, overview of uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And the forum is now open for questions. Uh, we haven't received any questions uh, up to now. If you have any questions, we have time for one or two questions. So I would like to ask one question from Dr. Padi Singh. You were mentioning about uh, several uh, medications, different categories. Are there any combinations that we can use and practice in Sri Lanka? And also whether we have any evidence uh, uh, with regard to psychotherapy uh, in the Sri Lankan population? Uh, with regard to your last question, I don't think we have any uh, uh, local evidence with regard to psychotherapy uh, uh, with our patients. Uh, uh, combinations, uh, usually these com drugs come in uh, you know, individual, individually, uh, but uh, combination that I can think of is there's a combination of mevaverine plus soluble fiber. Cilium plus mevaverine, there's a combination. Uh, called uh, polospas fibro, but otherwise, usually these drugs come in uh, you know, individually. If you want to give several drugs, you have to give them individually. Okay, we have one question. Uh, one of our attendees asking uh, causes for irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, causes. Uh, it, it's a. It's a. Uh, uh, it's a problem between the uh, gut in the gut brain axis. Uh, the the gut and the brain communicates via neurons. Uh, so there's a uh, the the brain tends to interpret the signals that they that the gut gives it uh, to a higher extent, uh, high sensitivity, and the the signals that the uh, brain sends back to the gut again the gut uh, uh, tends to over interpret it. Uh, that's why you get the uh, uh, you know uh, the bowel symptoms out of that the pain because the bowel sends more signals to the brain and the the, the gut symptoms because the bowel tends to uh, uh, interpret the gut uh, the brain symptoms more than a normal person but there are no specific like uh, genetic basis or anything behind that okay thank you very much uh, in the absence of further questions uh, I would like to thank again uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kadi Singh uh, for joining us today. And we would like to hand over the certificate of uh, appreciation for giving us this talk. Thank you. Thank you.